Well, here we are, back in the lab rat lab. Now, in a previous episode, I talked about parachute physics. Now, today, I want to talk about parachute opening loads. Parachutes generally fail during the inflation process because that's when the loads and the shocks are the highest. Now, NASA understands this all too well because they've been trying to develop a large parachute for the Mars 2020 lander. And they've had a number of failures during the deployment process during testing. They finally got the design tweaked and got it to survive, and now they have a system that can decelerate a large Mars 2020 lander to get it to Mars. Now, my testing that I'm going to do as part of this episode are not as sophisticated as those that NASA had done, but gives you an idea of how you go about testing a parachute system and how to test for shock attenuation. Well, I'm going to talk about some physics, I'm going to do a little bit of math as usual, and then I'll do some experimentations to see how things work out. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, when parachutes open, they can generate loads that greatly exceed those predicted by the general drag equation at steady state conditions. Now let's take a look at a couple images of what it looks like when a parachute fails during the deployment process. In the image on the left, we see a parachute canopy failure during an actual Apollo mission. Luckily, the parachutes are redundant, so the capsule and crew survived. At the right is a recent NASA capsule test. And you see that the parachute totally shredded and the capsule free fell into the ocean. No one was on board, so no one got hurt during that test. Now let's take a look at a simplified animation showing what happens when a parachute inflates. Here's the canopy just after it deploys. Now as the payload and parachute moves to the atmosphere, it scoops up a bubble of air. And this air is initially at rest, and this resting air has inertia and thus wants to resist being accelerated. Now the moving payload body also has inertia, and it wants to keep moving, so it does not want to be decelerated. Now it's these opposing inertial states that cause a large opening force to exist during deployment. Now once the captured bubble of air is accelerated and the system reaches a steady state condition, the inertial imbalance becomes greatly diminished and the loads in the system decrease. Now engineers need to be able to predict opening loads if they're going to be able to properly design a parachute system. Now over the years, extensive testing has been done on parachutes and has allowed us to determine an equation to predict opening loads. Now, while the equation is relatively simple, there are two very critical inputs, and it takes engineering insights to properly select those values. Now, let's take a quick look at the equation and discuss those critical inputs. The equation comes from the Handbook of Astronautical Engineering. And that equation states that the opening shock is the drag of the fully open parachute at parachute deployment times a factor called x sub zero and x sub one. Now x sub zero is known as the opening load shock factor, and that's dependent on the shape of the parachute. X sub one is the opening shock decrease factor, and that depends on the operating conditions of the parachute during deployment. Now factors x sub zero and x sub one are determined experimentally. Now x sub zero, the opening load shock factor, is driven by the shape and porosity of the parachute canopy. Now here are some x sub zeros for various parachute shapes. Flat, circular, and square have a X sub zero of 1.7, where the cross parachute has a slightly smaller X sub zero at 1.3. Now data on full-scale parachute opening shock factors is very limited. Now X sub one, the opening shock decrease factor, is driven by the canopy loading, the canopy filling time, the velocity, and altitude during parachute ejection. We see that X sub one is a range of values, ranging from 1.0 to 0.02. Now the large X sub 1, 1 1.0, is for the infinite mass conditions. And the smaller X sub 1s are for systems such as large drag and low weight conditions or model rocket deployments. Now infinite mass is a condition where the system velocity does not change once the parachute is deployed. Now examples of this include wind tunnel tests and drop tests of small parachutes with heavy suspended loads. Now, the data that's been generated over the years are for full-scale parachute systems. Unfortunately, they don't quite apply to model rocket parachutes. So what we're going to have to do is establish our own experiments to determine the critical variables that go into the opening load equation. And what I've done is I've developed a simple drop test apparatus to be able to test parachutes, to look at shock loads, and look at shock attenuation. So let's go ahead and take a look at the apparatus. Here's my test apparatus. I have two eight foot two by fours, and they're used to suspend two guide wires. And they run from the top of the rig down to the floor. 
Now this test block is free to slide up and down the guide wires with very little friction. And to the test block, I've attached the load cell, which measures the parachute opening loads. Now the parachute system is attached to the load pin on the load cell, and the test block is allowed to free fall for a certain amount of distance prior to deploying the parachute. As the parachute descends and opens, the opening loads are measured by the load cell. Here's an image of the tube where the parachute is stowed prior to the drop. Keeps the parachute nice and closed and keeps everything consistent from test to test. Now here is the test block and load cell prior to drop. And we see the slack in the string. Now it's the slack that allows the system to free fall for a certain amount of distance before the parachute is extracted from the deployment tube. Now here's three images of a test. Here the test block is just falling and you can see that the parachute has just deployed from the storage tube. Now a fraction of a second later, the parachute begins to open, and then a fraction of a second later, the parachute is fully open. This happens very quickly. And it's in this state is when we measure the maximum opening loads of the parachute system. Okay, now we got some of the theoretical background behind us. Let's go ahead and have some fun and do some experimental drop tests. Wow, that parachute opens up pretty quick. We're gonna have to take a look at some slow motion video to see what's going on with that canopy. Okay, now I've completed all my experimental runs. Let's take a look at the results. Here's a data sample from one of the drop tests. This is for the 0.5 meter free fall. You see here is where the test block is released and it free falls for about one third of a second until it pulls a parachute out of the storage tube. Now this is not drag, this is actually friction of the parachute coming out of the tube. Now here is where the parachute begins to open and the loads increase during descent. And the maximum load recorded in this test was 1.32 newtons. Now, if we look at just the parachute opening, we see here as the canopy opens up, the load increases. At some point, it reaches a maximum, and then the drag begins to slow the system down, so it begins to move towards a steady state drag condition. Now, the spike is not real data. This is where the system actually hits the ground. And we see that the parachute opened in 0.154 seconds, so it happens very quickly. Here's the data from all the drop tests. I have the free fall distances here, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 1, and 1.4, the measured fall times, and using those two values, I can calculate the deployment velocity during parachute opening. Now here's the load data I collected for each of the trials, and here are the average opening loads for each of those deployment velocities. And I plotted that data here on this XY plot, showing extraction velocity and opening load. Now here's tabulated data. Here are the opening loads for each of the extraction velocities, and here's a steady state drag for each of the parachutes at those velocities. Now the steady state drag is calculated by using the extraction velocity in the drag equation. And the opening load is the maximum force that was measured during a drop test. The difference in these load values represents the opening shock. Now that data can be used to calculate the opening load shock factor. Now X sub zero, the opening load shock factor, is equal to the measured opening load divided by the calculated steady state drag at parachute deployment. Now the lab rat drop tests indicate that the opening load shock factor X sub zero is not linear for small model rocket parachutes. Thus an equation must be established so that values can be estimated for cases not directly tested. So what I did was I used the Excel spreadsheet and I selected the polynomial curve fit to determine an equation it closely fits the curve of this line. And you see the equation here. And that allows me to calculate shock factors for extraction velocities that were not tested. Here's how we estimate the opening loads for a model rocket. First, we use a curve fit equation determined earlier to calculate X sub zero, which is the opening load shock factor. We then assume one of the following opening shock decreasing factors. Now these values are consistent with small model rockets. So for a small, a lightweight model rocket, X sub one should be 0 
for a medium-sized high-powered rocket, we can assume X sub 1 is 0 0.12. And for a heavy, high-flying, high-powered model rocket, we can use X sub 1 of 0 0.2. Now let's do a sample calculation. Let's calculate the opening load for a 50 centimeter flat circular parachute and a lightweight model rocket flying at 10 meters per second when the parachute is deployed. First, we calculate the canopy area. The area is equal to pi r squared. That comes out to be 0 0.2 meters squared. And then calculate the instantaneous drag if it pops open fully at the 10 meters per second. And that drag is equal to 1 half rho v squared CDS. And that comes out to be 15.9 newtons. Now, we calculate the opening shock factor, x sub 0, using the equation, and that comes out to be 3.8. Now, since we're talking about a small model rocket, we use an x sub 1 of 0 0.08. And we calculate the opening shock, of course, using the equation, it's the drag times x sub 0 times x sub 1, and that comes out to be 4.8 newtons. So that's the opening load shock that this model rocket will see when the parachute pops open. Now, this value is significantly lower than the drag calculated in step 2, because the rocket is lightweight and the system slows down extremely fast. Now, while the deceleration will be high, the lightweight rocket results in a small load. Now, in contrast, a very heavy rocket with the same chute and the same deployment conditions would have an opening shock on the order of 12 newtons. Now, there are a number of ways to reduce opening loads and to be able to attenuate the shock loads during parachute deployment. Let's take a look at some simple techniques. Here's some ways to minimize opening loads. You can make the parachute open slower. You can use a more porous canopy material. You can use an apex vent, which is a hole in the top of the parachute. Or you can make a shock absorbing system. Now, canopy area control is known as staging and reefing. Staging is a technique for using multiple parachutes and opening them in a controlled sequence. Here you can see a drogue parachute, which comes out first, and then the main canopy, which then deploys. Now, reefing is a technique of holding the base of the parachute canopy partially closed by a loop of rope. This loop of rope is cut by a pyrotechnic line cutter a few seconds after parachute opening, and that helps reduce opening loads. Now, while reefing is not practical in model rockets, stage recovery systems are routinely used in high-powered hobby rockets. Now, here's a graph showing the loads during a reefed and disreefed parachute. Here we can see the parachute deploys. It goes down to its reefed state, which is partially held closed, and it just reefs, and we see the various loads during those phases. Now, if we did not have the reefed parachute, we would see a much higher load as represented by this red line. Now, permanent materials, which is also known as porosity, allows more air to move through the canopy, and thus reduces the mass of air that needs to be accelerated during parachute opening. Now, that porosity also affects the drag coefficient, the stability, the inflation time, and ultimately the opening shock. Now, caution must be taken because if the canopy is too porous, it may not open. Now, the apex vent, which is a hole at the top of the canopy, also allows air to escape from inside the canopy, resulting in a lower internal pressure and also less mass that has to be accelerated by the opening canopy. Now, this also has a problem because if the vent is too large, the internal pressure may be too low and the canopy may not properly inflate. Now, there are many methods of shock absorption. You can use an elastic cord, a simple solid cord, slip loops, which pull open during deployment, or brake loops, which are sewn loops, which snap and break dissipating energy as the parachute opens. Now let's conduct some simple experiments to see just how well these techniques work. Here's my shock attenuation test apparatus. It's the same rig I use for my parachute opening load tests. However, in this case, I've got my load cell physically attached to the rig itself. Now the shock attenuation system is attached between the load cell and the test block. And I can set the weight of this test block and the drop height of the test block in order to give me the necessary snatch load to test the material. Now by trial and error, I determine the free fall drop of the test block in order to mimic the opening load calculated by the earlier equations. Now here I have my force sensor attached to the rig. And here you can see the uh, test weight here and the drop block, and here is the test material. In this case, it's a rigid nylon cord. Okay, so let's go ahead and do some testing. Here's my test apparatus. Again, my drop weight, which I can drop from various heights. It's attached to a cotton string 
which has very little elasticity, so it has very little shock attenuation. And that string is attached to my load cell for measuring my shock load. Now what I want to do is find the proper drop height to give me my 5 Newton shock load. So I'm going to start off with 10 centimeters and see what kind of load I get there. 3, 2, 1, drop. Okay, that load was substantially higher than I need. So let me try about 8 centimeters. 3, 2, 1, drop. Okay, that's still a little high. So let me go ahead and try 5 centimeters and see if that gives me close to my 5 newtons I need. 3, 2, 1, drop. Okay, that looks pretty good. Let me do it one more time. Make sure we get roughly the same reading. 3, 2, 1, drop. Okay, great. That gives me a little over 5 newtons, but that's close enough for this testing. Now let's check out the elastic band. Now I'll test my elastic band. See what kind of shock attenuation I'll get. Here's my elastic band from this point to here. It's a little less than half a meter. Now do the drop from the same 5 centimeters as before and see what kind of load we get. 3, 2, 1, drop. Okay, got some good data. I'll repeat the test several times, get an average, and then compare it to the unattenuated drop test. Now let's take a look at the results from the shock attenuation experiments. Here's the results from the shock attenuation tests. Now using a five centimeter drop, I could create a five Newton spike, which mimicked the opening loads predicted by the equations. I employed the elastic band in the same apparatus with the same five centimeter drop height. I got a peak load of only one Newton. So there's a drastic reduction in the opening shock between the cotton string and the elastic band. Now here I'm comparing the reaction time for the string and the elastic band. You can see for the cotton string was a very short reaction time, and for the elastic band, a very long reaction time, but of course a much lower force. So it looks like the elastic band does a good job at attenuating the opening shock of the parachute system. Here's another test I conducted. In this case, I had an opening load of a little over 40 newtons. Again, I used a rigid cord to sort of set my required drop height. I tested slip loops and a larger elastic band. And you can see that the attenuation was pretty substantial in both those cases. So both of these attenuation techniques are good. Here's some other parachute experiments that could be conducted. We could look at the effect of apex vent size on opening loads, or we could look at the effect of canopy porosity on opening loads, or also the effect of elastic band length on shock attenuation. There's all kinds of cool experiments that could be conducted. Well, I hope I provide you with some interesting insights on parachute opening dynamics. Now, there are lots of experiments that I think you can do at home, and I encourage you to expand on my experimentation to do your own home research on parachutes and parachute opening. Well, I hope to see you next time at Lab Rat Scientific.